long years stretch behind us into the past, forming corridors of time which echo to the bugle sound of valor. Those years and that valor have been given tangible focus here in this quiet shrine of tribute, the Hall of Heroes. Here on the inner ring of the Pentagon, this space is dedicated to a nation's remembrance, not of events, but of deeds. Deeds of Americans in uniform who gave more than was asked, more than could be asked of them. Not always their lives, but always themselves, without pause and without reservation. Each man whose name appears on these walls and those whose names will appear here are members of a unique fraternity of courage. They are all recipients of our nation's highest award, the Medal of Honor. It is given to those whose actions meet the standard spelled out in these few words. Gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of life above and beyond the call of duty. To such men, the Hall of Heroes was dedicated on a sunny spring day, May 1968. Today we confer the Medal of Honor on four more gallant Americans. This is the first time that four men from each of the military services have been so honored together. Charles E. Hagemaster, James E. Williams, Gerald O. Young, Richard A. Pittman. They will place their names now in a new hall of heroes created here in the Pentagon as a memorial to all who have earned their country's highest award for courage in combat. Seeing two of his comrades seriously wounded in the initial action, Specialist Hegemeister unhesitatingly and with total disregard for his own safety, raced through the deadly hail of enemy fire to provide them medical aid. Sergeant Pittman quickly exchanged his rifle for a machine gun and several belts of ammunition, left the relative safety of his position, and unhesitatingly rushed forward to aid his comrades. Petty Officer Williams was serving as patrol officer of two river patrol boats when the patrol was taken under fire by two sampans. He boldly led the patrol through the intense fire and damaged or destroyed 50 sampans and seven junks. Disregarding serious burns, Captain Young aided one of the wounded men and then attempted to lead the hostile forces away from his position. For more than 17 hours, he evaded the enemy until rescue aircraft could be brought into the area. With the addition of those four names, the roll call of valor totaled 3,210. Each name a reminder which illuminates for every man who reads it a higher vision of his kind. Originally, there was only one version of the Medal of Honor. Today, there are three. This one, specifically for the Army. And there, another one for the men of the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. And finally, one for the Air Force. They all, however, celebrate the same qualities and actions. Qualities and actions which add up to what we call, inadequately, heroism. It's a quality whose high connotation is safe now, as always. Because those who would pull it down somehow never stand quite tall enough to reach it. It is a quality for all times and all people. And for us as Americans, its roots reach back to our first beginnings. It was there to put steel into the determination of the ragged ranks which moved to defy the British at Concord Bridge. It 
it was there in the hearts of the first citizen soldiers who left homes and families gathering to pursue their awakening dream of national independence and individual liberty. It upheld them through the incredible hardships of years of struggle. It led them through Trenton and Saratoga and finally to Yorktown. The flame which lit from within those first men to call themselves Americans and to place their lives and all else that they had or might hope for in the balance of freedom was kindled there, never to go out. But the hard-won independence of the United States was to require reassertion again and again. The next test of whether American sovereignty was to be an accepted and honored fact among the nations of the world came in 1812. The British practice of stopping American ships on the high seas and impressing American seamen into the British Navy was at issue here, and the war was primarily a naval one. Its one major land battle has come to be known as the Battle of New Orleans. Stubborn, resourceful American woodsmen faced advancing ranks of disciplined British forces who fell bravely, but in numbers too great to be borne. In the end, this brief war of 1812 made its point to the watching world. Americans would live in liberty and individual citizens would enjoy their rights as citizens wherever on earth they might travel. No names appear here from among the ranks of those who fought in 1812. The Medal of Honor had not yet come into being, but the qualities that the medal would one day be created to honor, these were there, as they have always been. And these qualities were soon again to be sorely tried. Before it was a century old, the nation faced a conflict that shook it to its foundation and marked in deep suffering the beginning of its maturity, the Civil War. It has been called the war of brother against brother, and so it was. A more tragically exact description would be hard to come by. The soldier in gray fought with fiery bravery that was rooted in a proud way of life, a tradition in which honor and gallantry were deeply fundamental. His skill and courage were never depleted, but in the end, his resources would be. The men of the Union forces at first suffered from the effects of overconfidence and disunity in their high commanders. But their ultimate mission, the preservation of the Union, was too desperately important to allow prolonged discouragement. On each man in blue, a profound responsibility rested. Whether the nation endured would depend heavily on his faith in the Union's cause and his ability to prove that faith in the most demanding of all testing grounds. So it was that the nation, searching in its agony for the promise of its future, found itself looking into the faces of its sons. The longings, fears, and loneliness of a boy coming suddenly to manhood. This was so like the developing state of the nation itself. Soldier and nation together found that their fears and doubts were not so strong as their faith in the cause of a unified country. The soldier in blue kept that faith and fought for it with steadfastness and courage. And a grateful people in the midst of war forged a medal to honor that courage. In the swirling fury of this war of American against American, the Medal of Honor was born. The end we know, because we live in the unity that this tragic war preserved. And in national shrines like Gettysburg, we memorialize the men of both sides who gave of themselves unreservedly for what they believed to be right.
Here are the names. The last of the men in blue are gone, but the union they preserved remains and honors for all time the men who made it possible. And right over here is a roll call of names from the years which followed the Civil War, the time when the nation grew, expanding westward, the West. Charged with the task of making the frontier safe was the regular army. Out west, that meant the cavalry. The troopers who rode into that wide country were vastly outnumbered. And their adversary was often a master of combat, a rawhide tough and experienced fighter, dangerous to underestimate. This era in America's growth has passed into legend but real men lived it. Many were awarded the Medal of Honor. The names of their battlegrounds are obscure now, most of them. Others will never be forgotten. Names like Little Bighorn, where 24 of the men who stood with Custer won the nation's highest award. But wherever he fought, on the plains, among the buttes, or in the timber, he got the job done. That job was simple enough to state. It was to establish security and stability across the vast middle reaches of the continent. to ocean, the Union stretched, and the continental United States was changed from a goal to a fact. But full security had only just been established in the great western country within our borders when Americans were called on to do battle outside our shores. In the Spanish-American War, America's desire to help the Cubans to their independence from Spain flamed into action when the battleship Maine was blown up in Havana Harbor. Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders made their famous charge through a storm of whistling lead up the slopes of San Juan Hill. Thirty soldiers of this war won the nation's highest tribute, the first to win Army Medals of Honor on foreign soil. 81 Navy and Marine Corps fighting men were also awarded the medal. This first conflict by American ground forces outside our nation's borders was brief, but it was a hint of things to come. America's growth, the prospering of the adventurous idealism on which it was founded, these were making the United States a world power, a position of world leadership, unsought but unavoidable, was even then being thrust upon the nation. This time, it was no isolated conflict. This time, the challenge to freedom and the involvement of free men in it were of such a scale that a name never used before in man's history was created to describe it, the World War. From our perspective in history, the First World War. In his hundreds of thousands, it was the world war. On the personal level, it was perhaps very little different from any war, any time. Where'd that sergeant go? We do to move out any... Wow, take your time, Sarge. Don't hurry on my account. Where do they get them all? There's not that many shells in the... Oh, you lousy... How can we go out there? How? We can't move till... I wish I was home. I wonder what they're doing at... Home? Oh, come on! 
on, let's do something. The war that faced the Doughboy was one of massed firepower and jagged trench lines cutting across the heart of France. Facing and using weapons more deadly than ever in history, the men in olive drab pressed the attack, each enemy position a step forward. Bravery is not fearlessness. It is going on in spite of fear. A million men met this definition across the scarred and flaming fields of France, and the bravest of the brave, 95 of them, join the roll call of those who wear the Medal of Honor. 95 names. A private who silenced four machine gun positions and was killed while charging into the fifth. The captain, cut down by machine gun fire, who led his company to its objective from a stretcher. And the legendary sergeant from Tennessee, whose one-man assault on an enemy position brought in 132 prisoners. The war to end all war was over, or so many of us in our inexperience believed, but a mere heartbeat of history, two decades, would prove otherwise. A lot of our firepower was at the bottom of Pearl Harbor. With what remained, we paid a little something on account. And while we bought time, 14 million Americans responded by training for the greatest and most destructive war in history. So began World War II. And before it was over, 430 from among the 14 million would win the Medal of Honor. Some would come upon their moment on islands of the Pacific. Others in African desert or the steep and hostile terrain of Italy. But for each, it would be a moment when somehow the price that action might exact from them was left unconsidered, shouldered aside by their individual commitment to meet the need for that action. D-Day, 5,000 ships, And on every one of them, men thinking of loved ones, of home, of just how much they had to lose. My darling, we got your letter dated May 25th, and as always, I've read it a dozen times. I keep them all. We'll read them together someday. Johnny is as tall as my shoulder, fine and straight, and there's more of you in his eyes every day. Mom and Dad are well, and they send their love. I have your letter here, and will read it again before sleep. Meantime, try to know how much I love you. Come back safe to us. Come back safe. came, D-Day had begun. For each man who made it, this landing held a moment beyond which everything would be remembered in a kaleidoscope of bits and pieces. This was the moment when the ramp dropped down, and there was the beach. They knew what they were to do. They knew where and in what sequence they had to do it. The thing they didn't know was, could it be done? It could be, and somehow it was. 
but only the men who were there would ever really know what it took from each of them. We know only that what it took, they gave. From D-Day onwards, their strength never stopped growing, and the spearheads of that strength penetrated steadily inward toward the enemy's heartland, sometimes slowly and then more swiftly as Allied strength mounted and that of the enemy was worn away. The end was inevitable, and finally it came, first in Europe, then quickly in the Pacific. The second conflict to bear the name of World War was over. Once again, hundreds of thousands came gratefully home. Others remained in ground they had bought and paid for with the ultimate currency of life itself. Unlike the doughboy of World War I, the serviceman returning from Europe or the Pacific was not so quick to believe that the conflict just ended had ended war for all time. But he did know this. Forces which had once again threatened to destroy his way of life had been defeated and that way of life preserved. And he knew too that without him it could not have been done. Korea, June 1950. For the first time, the armed aggression was that of a communist enemy. The answer was clear and emphatic. Through years of what became stalemate combat, while truce talks wore on, men did what had to be done. Constant patrolling, fighting again and again over the same bits of splintered ground, day and night. In the end, the point had been made once again that aggression against free men would be met and thwarted. These names, 131 of them, were added to the roll call of valor during the Korean conflict. And here in the Hall of Heroes, this is the last honor roll but one. This latest section has not yet been completed. Earlier you saw four of the men whose names appear here. Like all the rest, they are an illustrious company. And once again, the challenge they face is far from our shores. Here, as in every conflict the American fighting man has faced, the effectiveness of all else depends upon him, the man himself. True, the means of his combat, the swiftness of his mobility, and the staggering volume of his firepower are such as the battlefield has never known before. But the man himself and the inner force that animates him, these are unchanged. He arrives at his objective faster and fresher than any man of arms in history, and in his hands are weapons more deadly than any of the past. But he well knows that despite all the technological advances, in the final analysis, there is no easy road. He knows, too, that however hard the road, others have traveled it before him, and what men have done, men can do. What enables a man to move forward into a maelstrom of roaring, slashing sound and flying steel and flame? The mere words in which a commander shapes the orders to do so? The knowledge that the others who move forward count on him to be in his place? A sense of pride that will not let him do less than his friends or leave them with more to do because of him? Or the simple consciousness that this is going to be done and it is his time to do it? Whatever it is, whether we name it courage, sense of duty, 
bravery, or simply guts. It is there, and they go and get it done. In the Vietnam fighting, many Americans have been awarded the Medal of Honor. In the combat zone, you will find the face of courage casually worn anywhere you care to look. And so the honor is doubly great for those who, from among the brave, are singled out. In one sense, these medals are no more than stylized bits of metal. But in another, more fundamental sense, they are the tangible representation of a priceless intangible. This then is in celebration of that something in man which is both indefinable and undeniable. For this, the Hall of Heroes exists to say to all who come this way, read these names. Think for a moment of the men whose courage put them here. What they did each in his own moment is a statement, a shout, a cry that echoes for each of us. Remember and be proud. The motion pictures that you're about to see were produced by the newsreel facilities of Cosbin. They were captured several months ago near the Cambodian border by elements of the 173rd Airborne Brigade. Now, many of the captured newsreels were damaged or of poor quality, but we salvaged enough film to provide a good close-up look of the Viet Cong and their operations. Living the Viet Cong as the Viet Cong would like to see themselves. In the first sequence, we take you behind enemy lines for a series of reports of the VC in combat. Now, these scenes of preparation and action were probably staged, but they do show the Viet Cong tactics and techniques. Translated, this title reads, Military Operations by the 9th Viet Cong Main Force Division in retaliation for the bombings of Hanoi and Haiphong. Division members are summoned before the division political officer just prior to moving to the attack site. Squad and platoon leaders wear banners proclaiming their determination to avenge the bombings of the North. Similar pledges are printed on cards fastened to the hats of individual soldiers. Here, the division political officer presents ropes to regimental political officers as a sign of his confidence that the battle will be won and prisoners will be taken. The regimental political officers, in turn, use the ropes to inspire confidence in the soldiers directly under their command. The bugler sounds the attack. 
and the individual platoons and companies move on foot to their respective positions. The Viet Cong attack is against an American armored personnel carrier. The vehicle is destroyed and several members of its crew are killed. Prisoners captured during the battle are marched barefoot through the jungle. Next, we have a series of newsreel sequences on Viet Cong attacks against Allied units in South Vietnam. With Tay Minh's Black Virgin Mountains in the background, the communist guerrillas make ready. Women and children carry supplies and ammunition to the designated depots. Weapons and equipment used by the VC are Soviet models, most of which have been manufactured in communist China. The first attack will be against a South Vietnamese outpost, manned by soldiers of the Civilian Irregular Defense Group, the CIDG. A final communications check is made using both communist and captured American manufactured equipment. The South Vietnamese forces walk into the ambush and the Viet Cong open fire. Again, the dead are both South Vietnamese and Americans. The jungle has provided the Viet Cong with a strategic sanctuary from which to strike. When the battle is ended, no weapons are left behind. Any Viet Cong who brings in an enemy weapon is decorated for his heroic deed. The captured equipment is of great importance to the communists in their guerrilla war. And this fact is emphasized strongly in these propaganda newsreels. When the weapons and ammunition have been returned to the base camp, they're logged in, stockpiled, and checked out for the next communist assault. The enemy in the Republic of Vietnam makes use of every tactic, old and new, in guerrilla warfare. In this next sequence, the Viet Cong company commander plots an all-out attack against a small South Vietnamese hamlet. Uger once again sounds the charge and the VC stream out of the jungle to overrun the settlement. The communists have undergone grueling physical training programs to prepare themselves emotionally and psychologically for the harsh demands of guerrilla warfare. Attacks such as the one shown here are undertaken to harass Allied units in the area. Prisoners are taken and they're identified as members of the Civilian Irregular Defense Guard and the 10th Vietnamese Government Army Division. The PWs, as in the earlier sequence, are marched off for interrogation. With the battle won, the Viet Cong are welcomed into the hamlet by their communist supporters. And according to the original newsreel commentary, a special program is presented by the women of the settlement in tribute to their so-called liberators.
It's important to remember that the film you've seen and will see is good punk propaganda. Its purpose is to show you one side, the communist side, of the conflict in the Republic of Vietnam. At the same time, it does provide a realistic insight into the motives and the methods of the BC. Now we've seen the enemy in combat. Now let's look at another side of the communist war effort in South Vietnam. In the area of operations that shows the Viet Cong work in the fields of logistics and demolition. Much of the food, weapons, and equipment used by the Viet Cong is transported into tactical areas by walking the material across the countryside. Here, bags of rice are carried across a river and into the jungle. Women, many of them armed, make up more than half of the communist transportation force. Another of the primary means of transportation is by bicycle. Each bicycle is reinforced so that it can carry more than 300 pounds over rough terrain and up to 500 pounds on level ground. The Viet Cong are equally thorough in their utilization of captured weapons and equipment. Demolition experts disassemble unexploded bombs and remove their destructive contents. Blacksmiths then use the metal to make grenade casings and gun barrels. In the guerrilla warfare that the Viet Cong are waging, nothing is wasted. Everything is utilized. The communists adapt their ways to the war they must fight. Booby traps are fashioned by hand and planted at night outside the perimeter of U.S. and South Vietnamese camps. Next, we see a graphic demonstration of the methods used and the objectives achieved in sabotaging railroads and bridges in the Republic of Vietnam. The communists, wherever they can, coerce or impress local inhabitants to help them in their destructive raids. A government train that has been derailed is grim witness to the effectiveness of the VC tactics. Blasting is more expensive, but the results are also more thorough. Small charges placed at the joints of the rails on both sides of the track can tear open gaps that are undetectable at a distance and will almost certainly cause a derailment. Here, with the aid of a model bridge, a Viet Cong instructor briefs a communist guerrilla before sending them out with the demolition team. The explosive charge is prepared by other members of the guerrilla unit. The VC move through the jungle toward their objective. Reaching the bridge, the communist guerrillas climb the span to plant their explosives. The locations are pre-planned, for a reconnaissance team has already visited the bridge and determined the best locations for placing the charges. Mission accomplished. The bridge is destroyed. Up 
to now, we've been through the eyes of the communist camera at the battlefront of the Viet Cong. In this sequence now, we're going to focus on various propaganda and non-military activities of the enemy. We'll tour war zone C with Chinese communist correspondents, visit the VC printing office, explore an underground hospital, and watch a propaganda lecture by a four-star North Vietnamese army general who's the political officer and commanding general of the self-proclaimed South Vietnamese Liberation Army. This third segment of our captured Viet Cong newsreels opens with banners and signs welcoming communist Chinese writers on their arrival for a tour of Cosman facilities in War Zone C. There is the customary exchange of toasts between the guests and their hosts. And as part of the welcoming reception, the representatives of the two communist nations exchange photographs of Ho Chi Minh and Mao Zedong. An entertainment troupe from North Vietnam is also on hand, and the Chinese writers witness a performance of traditional Vietnamese dances. The communist correspondents visit a printing plant that publishes the Viet Cong Liberation newspaper and other propaganda leaflets and literature. They watch the setting of type by a VC craftsman and they see the operation of the primitive press by the printer and his apprentice. The visit concludes with the presentation to the group of the latest issue of the Viet Cong Liberation newspaper. Located in the heart of War Zone C, the main hospital for Cosman has facilities to care for up to 500 patients. The wounded Viet Cong soldiers are carried from the battle area to the hospital in hammock-type litters. The casualties are met by doctors and nurses, quickly examined, and assigned to wards in the underground hospital. Once again, the motion pictures give evidence of the ways in which the Viet Cong adapt themselves to the conditions under which they wage their war of insurgency. next scenes, the hospital has a distinguished visitor, a four-star general, Noyan Chi Tan, member of the North Vietnam Politburo and former political officer of the North Vietnamese Army. When these films were made, the general was the political officer and commanding general of the Communist Army in South Vietnam. Here, General Tan walks among the wounded, talking with them and listening to them. Continuing his tour of the underground facilities, the General commends the hospital staff for its contributions to the Viet Cong war effort. General Tan has a final visit and a word with a wounded VC soldier, pledging continued reinforcements and communist support from the North. Now, a meeting of Cosman officials held to plan the winter-spring offensive of 1967 and to bolster troop morale for these campaigns. The featured speaker is the chief of the political section of Cosman, Brigadier General Trong Do. The general tells the troops that there are 400,000 men in North Vietnam that can be sent south to aid the Viet Cong forces. In conclusion, he promises that North Vietnam will never negotiate for peace until it has achieved a measure of victory in combat that can be used as a bargaining power in such negotiations.
This then is the challenge posed by the Viet Cong and her supporters in South Vietnam. We've seen from their own motion pictures that they're resourceful, disciplined, ruthless, determined. Alert to this threat, aware of this danger, South Vietnam and her allies must meet and defeat the enemy challenge. For in this confrontation between communism and freedom, only one can prevail. Which one it'll be is simply stated by free men fight in the Republic of Vietnam. In closing, let us emphasize again that these films were produced as communist propaganda to promote the communist cause in South Vietnam. At the same time, let us also remember that they have provided an in-depth close-up opportunity to know your enemy, the Viet Cong.